welcome to this worship service at First United Methodist Church. Our scripture uh, today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 13th verse. Hi, I'm Patty Hanold. And I'm Heidi Kesko. We're members of the Chancel Choir of First Methodist Church. We can't sing yet, but we can still read. Our first scripture today is Matthew 16, verses 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. I'll be reading from Philippians 2, 4 through 11. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Two men met on the street one morning, and one says to the other, have, have you heard about Harry? He embezzled the company out of a half a million dollars. The other man said, well, that's terrible. I, I never did trust that scoundrel. And the first then said, well, not only that, he left town and he took Tom's wife with him. The other man said, well, that's awful. Harry's always been a ne'er-do-well. And the first man said, not only that, he stole a car to make his getaway. Oh, that's scandalous. I, I, I never did think much of Harry. He's a bad streak in him. And then the first one said, well, not only that, they think he was actually drunk when he pulled out of town. And the other man said, well, that Harry's simply no good. But what really bothers me is who is going to teach his Sunday school class this week? Harry, scoundrel, ne'er-do-well, bad streak, drunk, no good teacher. All words or names that are used to describe the very same man. Often the names we use to describe others are not the names or words that the person being described would use. Now, to be sure, not all descriptive names are meant to be insults. We may call our spouse dear or darling as our families grow. Other names for individuals seem to give some insight into what is important in one's life, or at least what we're proud of. A husband refers to his wife as mother because she is the mother of his children. The patriarch of the family is called grandpa by everyone, regardless of their age. We do use many names to refer to one another. A funeral was being held for a rather unsavory character that had never been uh, near a place of worship his entire life. The services were being conducted by a minister who had never heard of this man or met him. Carried away by the occasion, however, uh, the, the minister poured on the praise for the departed a little, a little too much. After 10 minutes of describing the late lamented as a wonderful father, a caring husband, a respected boss, 
the widow, whose expression had grown more and more puzzled as the preacher droned on, nudged her son and whispered, go up there and make sure that's your father. Sometimes the names we use for one another, like the names the preacher was using for the man, are not really the most appropriate or what we would really expect. My brother, Thomas, from the time he was born until approximately age 11, was called Tommy by everyone until one day he announced that he no longer wanted to be called Tommy, but rather Tom. In fact, he would throw fits when my parents would forget and accidentally refer to him as Tommy. Of course, this was just his way of saying he was growing up. He wanted to be acknowledged by those around him as, as, as more mature. And being the good older brother I was, I would call him Tommy for many years to come just to see his face get red and hear him yell. The point to all of this, of course, is that the names we use for one another offer some indication of how we view our relationship with them. Terms of endearment or negative comments indicate how we feel. Such was also the case in Jesus' day. And this morning's scripture from Matthew presents Jesus and the disciples dealing with this very issue. Jesus asks two questions. Who, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And who do you say that I am? The first, who do people say the Son of Man is, is, is an indirect way of asking, given what you know of my calling, my activity, the course of my ministry thus far, what's your understanding of my identity? What have you heard others say about me? What names have they called me, good or bad, and do you believe any of them? Perhaps some of the responses went as follows. Well, Jesus, some think you're the Baptist. Some call you a prophet, a teacher preacher, a carpenter, a zealot, an instigator, a troublemaker, a revolutionary. Well then, and now Jesus cuts to the chase, and even though Peter answers the question as the scripture clearly indicates, it's addressed to all of them, who do you say that I am? Now I suspect that's not because the others have no opinion about this that they don't answer. No, no, I wonder if perhaps they're all not standing around saying to themselves, well, what's Jesus getting at? He obviously wants a particular answer. A teacher, a healer, a preacher, a leader, a guide, a good shepherd. But, but which, which does he want us to say? Well, like that game show, Family Feud, they're all looking for the number one answer. And then, as usual, it's good old Peter. Steps forward. You are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the rest of them are all plotting, good answer, good answer, Peter. And Jesus responds, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, Peter, you're right. Of all the names, of all the words you could have used to describe me, you have chosen the most important one, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's upon that statement of faith that Jesus builds the church. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a pretty basic message, most of us would agree. But a message that's been overlooked, it's been misinterpreted, misunderstood, even ignored by both those outside as well as those, yes, inside the church in recent years. Isn't it amazing how in our ever-changing technological society, we find new and faster ways of communicating with one another almost daily, in days past, messages were delivered by messenger, oftentimes taking many days. In America, the Pony Express reduced the amount of time necessary for information to get through in the West. And after that, the Telegraph helped the process along, relatively soon followed by Alexander Graham Bell and his telephone. From the telephone and the letter, we've progressed to email and instant messaging. The desire for faster communication has always been a goal. Unfortunately, as the ages have passed and technologies have increased, options of ways to communicate have been enhanced. In reality, our abilities as human beings to communicate effectively and accurately has not. One of my favorite examples 
is, is the uh, story of how a simple message can quickly and unintentionally be altered due to poor communication. It goes this way, a school superintendent told his assistant superintendent the following. Next Thursday morning at 10.30, Haley's Comet will appear over this area. This is an event which occurs only once every 75 years. Call the school principals, have them assemble their teachers and classes on their athletic fields and explain this phenomenon to them. If it rains, then cancel the day's observation and have the classes meet in the auditorium to see a film about the comet. The assistant superintendent then passes along to the school principals. By order of the superintendent of schools, next Thursday at 10.30, Haley's Comet will appear over your athletic field. If it rains, then cancel the day's classes. Report to the auditorium with your teachers and students where you will be shown films of a phenomenal event which occurs once every 75 years. Principals to teachers. By order of the phenomenal superintendent of schools, at 10.30 next Thursday, Haley's Comet will appear in the auditorium. In case of rain over the athletic field, the superintendent will give another order, something which occurs only once every 75 years. And then the teachers to the students. Next Thursday at 10.30, the superintendent of schools will appear in our school auditorium with Haley's Comet something which occurs once every 75 years. If it rains, the superintendent will cancel the comet and will order us out to our phenomenal athletic field. The students then take that message to their parents. When it rains next Thursday at 10.30 over the school athletic field, the phenomenal 75-year-old superintendent of schools will cancel classes and appear before the school in the auditorium accompanied by Bill Haley and the comets. Indeed, it is quite easy to lose the real intent of a message as it's passed from person to person, maybe even more so generation to generation, age to age. Is it any wonder that over time, Jesus Christ has gone from being the one at whose name every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and every tongue confess that he is Lord, to just another great wise man whose words, if we choose to listen, are comforting, like just so many other religious leaders of history. Someone much wiser than I once put it this way, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. When you really think about it, it shouldn't surprise us the church is in the shape it's in today. Year in and year out, the mainline denominations continue to lose members, and each year we say, this is going to be the time we stop the decline and begin to turn things around. Our conferences and districts and others offer seminar after seminar on church growth and how to be more friendly and more caring, more open, more attractive, more accessible, more spiritual, more responsive, more energetic, more feeling, more, more, more. And that's not to say that we, we can't learn from some of those programs. But the one thing I rarely hear is how to be more Christian. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, Christ is the main thing. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Listen to the words from the poet. Come follow me, says the Lord, be at peace within my care. Be a child, show me your need. Take my hand and I will lead. Leave your worldly cares behind, free as a bird, soaring above, filled with my forgiving love. Now, if those words were spoken by a mere human being, even the most moral, ethical, loving human being that ever lived, they still would not inspire devotion. The great theologian C.S. Lewis once wrote, a man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level of the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him, you can kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us, and he did not intend to. One of the potentially tragic mistakes we can make is to view Jesus as less than he was and is. 
I remember speaking with a pastor one time who was celebrating the fact the program of ministry in his church had gone so well in its first week and large numbers of people unexpectedly showed up to participate and we sat in his office another friend in ministry was with us and commented the Lord's certainly doing some wonderful things here referring to the unexpected success of that program and then our first colleague said the Lord nothing it was me it was my hard work I was responsible yeah he actually said that and in a few short weeks the numbers and ministry disappeared completely. And on that point, he was right. He was responsible. Only when we acknowledge the fact that our God can do far more than we can ever imagine and that God is, in fact, in charge of our lives can we ever expect renewal. Michael Slaughter was pastor of a very large, dynamic United Methodist Church in in this country for many decades, Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church in Tip City, Ohio. And he puts it this way, church renewal consists of people in community with one another, dreaming God's vision, believing Christ's victory, and living out the Spirit's work. The evidence of renewal will be seen in transformed lives. See, it's more than just adding a little more Jesus. It's, it's not being a little more religious now and then, but attending a worship a little more frequently than in the past. Christ must be the center of our lives. And just how do we do that? Well, it's really a, a two-step process. First we come, and then we go. Jesus once said to the outcast tax collector Zacchaeus, come down from that tree, and his life was changed. It was Jesus who said, Come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Coming to Jesus is an important part of the message of the gospel, to be sure. And so we must continue to come together to praise the Lord. But if we look at scripture closely, we notice that other word, go. Remember the parable of the man who held a great feast and no one came? He sends his servants to the highways and the byways to bring in the poor and the hungry and the lonely. And he tells his servants, go to those places, force them to come in, because the feast will not begin until all are present. Well, hear these words. Share the love you feel this day with all whose hurt you find. If all do so, then love will flow through all of humankind. But in order to share, you have to go. When Christ is central in your life, you respond. There's a story told of a young soldier who was fighting in Italy during World War II. He jumped into a foxhole just ahead of some bullets, and he immediately tried to deepen the hole for more protection. So he's frantically scraping away at the dirt with his hands. He unearths something metal, and he brings it up and finds it's a silver cross left by a former resident of that same foxhole. A moment later, another leaping figure landed beside him as the shell screamed overhead. When the soldier got a chance to look up, he he saw that his new companion was in fact an army chaplain. And holding out the cross to that soldier, he said, Am I glad to see you? How do you work this thing? The same could be said of the world today. So many people, men, women, children, hurting, afraid, Statistic tell us that even in the midst of all of, of the things we're experiencing, that there's still a vast majority of Americans believe in God, and, and yet a, a, a very small amount practice their faith. There are millions of souls who are hurting and afraid, looking for answers and help and direction. Maybe they even have a Bible in their home or they wear a cross as jewelry around their necks, but they, they look at the Bible and the cross and they ask, well, how do you work these things? One fall weekend many years ago, I was in New York City for some meetings and had a very eye-opening experience. A group of us spent the evening at the theater and we walked through the city. It was around 11 o'clock at night, wanting to see the United Methodist uh, Church offices located across the street from the United Nations building. So we enjoyed our evening and we were out taking in the sights and looked in the doorway of the United Methodist offices and saw three people huddled in the corner 
underneath cardboard boxes, trying to sleep. One man had no shoes on his feet. A little farther down, a doorway of the Holy Family Church, two more men with newspapers over their bodies to keep them warm. Still further along, we saw a man sleeping in a trash dumpster, and we passed by them all. But the most striking scene was, was just a block away from where we were staying. The night was cooling down, people were cold. And as we hurried back to the hotel, I turned and I saw this man lying on a manhole cover in the middle of a concrete island with arms outstretched, face to the sky, as cars were just speeding by without giving him a second thought. And as I lay down in my bed that night, I realized I was able to pass them all by without much thought at all in order that I might enjoy myself. Now, how often do we close our eyes to the real suffering of others so that we might enjoy ourselves? And when we do that, are we really being faithful? How many needs do you read of in, in the week's paper or do you hear of on, on the news? The sad reality of this life is that there are people in need right in our very backyards and communities and we continue to look the other way. I think Paul said it best when he said, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also the interest of others. Let us do so recognizing that we live in a world filled with need. And as we gather together in fellowship, whether it is in person or virtually online, may we do so asking for Christ to be present in all the world, and especially in the lives of those the rest of the world has passed by. And let us resolve to open our eyes to needs of this pain-filled world and offer a caring word and a helping hand. May we remember that uh, obedience to the point of death on a cross means that our Lord was willing to do whatever was needed to be done in order to care for the needs of others. Not some great teacher, not some insightful prophet, but our Lord. Our Lord was not willing or able to pass by humanity as we suffered, and our Lord's resolve led to his death and our eternal life. Our challenge, our calling is to put Christ first, to worship him, to serve him, to follow him, to share him. And the day will surely one day come when at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen.